Watson is here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, it's so interesting when Scott Pelley did that piece on 60 Minutes and he was on the boat with you. It was an undisclosed location. Why? Well, I was at sea for uh, 15 months because uh, Japan issued uh, an arrest warrant for me for trespassing. I mean, nobody gets an extradition uh, order for trespassing, but it's all very political. And why so? Well, you know, uh, Japan um, has taken $30 million from the Tsunami Relief Fund to use just to try and shut down Sea Shepherd's activities. And so they sent army, uh, an army of lawyers after us. Uh, we've been charged with contempt in the uh, U.S. courts. Uh, but they haven't been able to stop Sea Shepherd. Uh, the three ships with 100 crew from 24 nations leave in a week to go down there. How would you characterize your tactics? As uh, enforcing international conservation law. And people who say they're too aggressive, too violent, and too risky, you say? They've destroyed one of our ships, injured our crew, and uh, they kill whales. So if you're talking about violence, it's the whalers who are violent. We have never injured anybody. Are you winning? Oh, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Last year, they only took 9% of the quota. The year before that, 17%. And so Sea Shepherd has been able to, uh, to, you know, to effectively shut down their illegal whaling operations in the Southern Ocean. Japan is by and far and large the biggest culprit. Yes, it is. It's the primary culprit, and uh, they're they're targeting endangered whales in a, in a internationally established uh, whale sanctuary in violation of a global moratorium on whaling, and they're in contempt of the Australian federal court. And why do they want these whales? Well, that's a good question because there's really no market for them. It's a, uh, it's like they have this policy: if we give in on whaling, we might have to give in on bluefin tuna, and nobody's going to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. And but this is a sanctuary that they're killing whales in, and. The nations of the world have a responsibility to uphold those laws, but they're not doing it. And because of that, non-government orga organizations have to do it. For Why aren't they upholding the law? It's not in their economic or political interest to do so. Mm -hmm. We have all the rules and regulations to protect our oceans, but no economic or political will to enforce them. What yeah. do you fear? Uh, I fear losing the whales. I fear losing, um, you know, diminishment of life in our oceans. If the, if the oceans die, we die. Many, many years ago, back in 1975, I had an encounter in the North Pacific with a sperm whale. A whale could have taken my life, chose not to do so. And uh, that made me think very deeply about what, what it was we're doing. It was a dying whale, and uh, he, I saw him fall, fall back and slide back into the sea rather than come forward and crush us. I said to myself, why am Why are we killing these whales? And the Russians didn't eat whale meat. They, use, they kill whales for sperm and spermaceti oil, which is used as a high heat resistant lubricating oil for machinery. And one of the things it was most valuable for was the construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. I said, here we are destroying this incredibly intelligent, socially complex, self-aware sentient being for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And it just struck me, we're insane. Our whole damn species is insane. And from that moment on, I just said, I, I'm, I'm not here for us, I'm here for them. If human beings can learn to live in harmony with all other species and live in accordance with the, the basic laws of ecology, the law of diversity, the law of interdependence, the law of finite resources, you know, no species has ever survived on the planet living outside of those three basic laws. So if we don't learn to live within the boundaries of those laws, we're not going to survive either. So will humanity be able to do that? I don't really know, you know. Um, at some point, maybe nature will force us into having to make that decision, but I don't see us making it willingly because there's too many temptations. Leonard Cohen in one of his uh, songs has a, a two lines that sum it up. He says, we're locked into our suffering and our pleasures are the seal. In other words, we're too busy feeling good and having a great time and entertaining ourselves to worry about the future. How much is going on in terms of overfishing and what's happening? A lot. I call it the economics of extinction. There's money to be made by driving species into extinction because as the numbers go down, the value of the fish goes up. One bluefin mm -hmm. tuna is worth $75,000 right now and the price is going up. When there's no more and the only ones left are in the warehouses in Japan, they'll be priceless. If an American president or an American administration wanted to stop the Japanese, could they? Yes, all they have to do is enforce uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce regulations against mm -hmm. Japan and Iceland, but they choose not to do so. Thank you, Paul. Really interesting. Thank you, Paul. My contribution and my crew in that is to save lives and to buy time, uh, you know, to protect habitats so we can measure our success and the number of lives saved, the number of illegal operations that we shut down. And uh, so we've been pretty successful in doing that. So I think that's the best thing that we can do right now, but also to encourage 
people to understand that each and every one of us can make a difference. And uh, we just have to use our individual's talents and skills and harness that to passion, imagination, and courage and we can make a difference. Uh, but I see more and more of that being done. You know, you can't depend upon governments or big organizations to change things. They never have, they never will. They usually cause the problems. Almost all social revolutions throughout history have been championed by individuals or small groups of individuals. Slavery wasn't ended by governments, it was ended by people like Wilberforce and Douglas. Uh, the women's rights movement, the suffragette movement, you know, that was led by women who were virtually unknown today, who were beaten and jailed and, and, and abused by the politicians who later took credit for what they did. Uh, so you need that kind of passion if you're going to make a difference. Overfishing. 90 to 100 million tons of fish are pulled from our oceans each year, with some sources even estimating 150 million tons. From the 1950s to 2011, worldwide catches increased fivefold, while the amount of fish in the sea was reduced by a half. Three quarters of the world's fisheries are exploited or depleted, and some scientists predict that we'll see fishless oceans by 2048. According to the most current report in 2014 from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the world's marine fisheries have expanded continuously to a production peak of 86.4 million tons in 1996, but have since exhibited a general declining trend. However, a more recent study published in 2016 challenges these statistics, finding gross underreporting of catches as well as issues with the FAO's data entry methods leading to underrepresentation. The study's creators, Daniel Pauly and Dirk Zeller, suggest that catch actually peaked at 130 million tons, rather than the FAO's 86.4 million, and has been declining much more strongly since. Their reconstruction of total catches showed a decline of over three times that of the reported data as presented by the FAO. With 60% of West Africa's and a staggering 92% of China's industrial fishing remaining unreported, even this corrected figure may not capture the full magnitude of commercial fishing. Statistics on ocean life in general remain cloudy, both due to the practical difficulties of tracking marine life and the terminology used by the tracking organizations. In their 2012 State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture Report, the FAO found that 87.3% of fish stocks were fully exploited or overexploited. However, comparing this figure to the reports before and after is no easy feat. Between their 2010 and 2012 reports, the FAO had reduced its level of exploitation terminology from six to three categories. Now, in the most recent report from 2014, they've further clouded the issue, replacing exploited with fished and introducing two vague categories termed sustainable and unsustainable levels. This terminology has the dual effect of both making the situation sound less dire and making the comparison between reports unnecessarily difficult. But when you pick through the data and unravel the terminology, the upward trend of fish stock depletion becomes clear. The bottom line is that as of the most current report from 2014 using 2011 data, less than 10% of our world's fisheries remain unexploited. It's not just the amount of fish being taken from the ocean for food that is the issue. Far more devastating are those non-target species unintentionally captured, termed bycatch, or more accurately, by kill. According to the FAO, for every one pound of fish caught, up to five pounds of unintended marine species are caught and discarded as bykill. Though figures can be as high as 20 pounds of untargeted species for every pound of targeted animals killed. A report that came out just a few weeks before this video found that in select U.S. fisheries alone, bycatch in 2013 totaled approximately 689.1 million pounds. All of the industrial fishing methods used around the world come with the high cost of bycatch. One study analyzed bycatch solely from pelagic longline fishing in the Pacific Ocean. Longlining is a method which uses a main fishing line up to 100 kilometers in length, with secondary lines branching off of it, each set with hundreds of thousands of barbed baited hooks. 
The study found that 4.4 million non-targeted marine animals are killed as bycatch due to pelagic longline fishing in the Pacific Ocean every year, including on average 3.3 million sharks, 1 million marlins, 59,000 sea turtles, close to 77,000 albatrosses, and almost 20,000 dolphins and whales. Trawling, the primary method used for shrimp, is often referred to as the ocean equivalent of clear-cutting rainforest, with 80 to 98 percent of unintended catches being thrown back into the sea, dead. It's estimated that 650,000 marine mammals, including whales, dolphins, and seals, are killed or seriously injured every year by commercial fisheries outside the United States. Because of this, Almost every foreign fish product sold in the United States enters the U.S. market in violation of federal law, namely the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which has remained pitifully unenforced for over 40 years. With 90% of all seafood consumed in the United States coming from foreign sources, this means that the American seafood industry has a large hand in devastating marine mammal populations while grossly violating its own federal law. The mechanical method used for fishing isn't the only issue. There's also the method of species targeting. Humans tend to go after the biggest fish first until they are no longer available. Then they move on down the chain, a process marine biologist Daniel Pauly termed fishing down marine food webs. The removal of apex predators leads to what's called trophic downgrading, where the loss of predators allows other species to grow unimpeded, upsetting the entire ecosystem. What comes to mind first is uncertainty, that we really don't know what the future is going to be. And the young generation today is probably the first generation in a long time that really has a very uncertain future because uh, the world's changing and changing very quickly, and uh, especially in what's happening in our oceans. So there's a lot of challenges. The ocean is the life support system for this planet. Uh, it provides uh, food, it provides oxygen, about up to 80% of the oxygen is supplied by phytoplankton in the sea. Uh, it uh, regulates temperature, storms, it is the life support system. And on Spaceship Earth, that life support system is run by a crew. And we're not crew, we're just simply passengers, we're having a great time amusing ourselves. But the crew, well, we're killing them. Everything from the bacteria through to the, the plankton, to the fish, to the great whales, to the trees, we're killing them. And there's only so many crew members you can kill before the machinery begins to collapse. And uh, that's where our future is heading right now, a collapsing life support system. Industrial fishing fleets have destroyed 90% of the fishes over the last 16 years. The whaling industry has devastated the entire whaling populations, driven many of them to the brink of extinction. And these are the species that keep everything running in the sea. For example, a blue whale. One blue whale every day defecates three tons into the sea. Three tons of iron, nitrogen-rich fertilizer. And that, of course, uh, provides nutrients for the phytoplankton, which in turn provides food to the zooplankton, which provides food to, to the fish and ultimately, again, to the whales. Since 1950, we've seen a 30 to 40% decline in phytoplankton populations in the ocean. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we diminished the whale population so much. We killed 300,000 blue whales in the 20th century. That's an incredible amount of iron, a nitrogen-rich fertilizer that has been taken away from the sea. One study suggests that the removal of sharks may contribute to climate change by leaving the unchecked numbers of species to feast on the ocean's vegetation, releasing the ancient carbon found there in massive quantities. Dr. Peter McCready, one of the study's authors, cautioned that if we just lose 1% of the ocean's blue carbon ecosystems, it would be equivalent to releasing 460 million tons of carbon annually, which is about the equivalent of about 97 million cars. It's about equivalent to Australia's annual greenhouse gas emissions. With 73 million sharks killed every year for the shark fin industry, and 40 to 50 million sharks dying every year as bykill, not to mention the impact of shark culls, the ocean's most vital predators are under attack, and the repercussions of their decimation will affect us all. 
Not only do fishers move from species to species, but they will also move from area to area, decimating one before moving on to the next. For example, 33% of the European Union's seafood comes from developing nations. While overfishing is certainly the most obvious drain on the world's fish and the most talked about, it is by no means the only cause. Ocean dead zones are a huge threat to marine life. Dead zones, or hypoxic zones, are areas of the ocean where there has been such a reduction in oxygen that animal life suffocates and dies. While ocean protection organizations will mention dead zones, they by and large ignore their number one cause, animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is the leading cause of not only ocean dead zones, but also species extinction, water pollution, and habitat destruction, all of which severely impact our oceans. In the documentary Cowspiracy, The Sustainability Secret, Dr. Richard Openlander discusses the immense impact of land-based animal agriculture on our oceans. Livestock operations on land has caused or created more than 500 nitrogen-flooded dead zones around the world in our oceans, comprise more than 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion about the state of our oceans has to always begin by frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture, which is not what our conservation groups, Oceana being the largest one in the world right now, uh, the most influential, as well as others, that's not what is at the apex of their discussions. Governments have made it increasingly more difficult for people to change things because they are taking advantage of uh, abstract threats which don't really exist to bring up laws which are suppressing everybody. You know, now all you have to do is hold up a protest sign to be called a terrorist. And uh, that's, uh, you know, we're living in a much less free world than I lived in in the 50s and 60s and 70s. You know, we had much more freedom back then. I mean, I, I think back to some of the things that we did in protests and campaigns, we would be killed if we did it today. In addition to not acknowledging the main cause of water pollution, habitat destruction, species extinction, and ocean dead zones, Oceana and other major ocean defense organizations propose that the solution to the decimation of ocean life is to eat sustainable seafood. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as sustainable seafood. With whales dying from starvation and 90% of all large fish species gone, the ocean can't even sustain itself, let alone the up to 150 million tons of sea life we pull from it every year. Additionally, sustainable seafood labels do not account for the greenhouse gas emissions caused by fishing. The 2013 State of the Ocean report stated, not only are we already experiencing severe declines in many species to the point of commercial extinction in some cases, and an unparalleled rate of regional extinctions of habitat types, we now face losing marine species and entire marine ecosystems, such as coral reefs, within a single generation. Unless action is taken now, the consequences of our activities are at a high risk of causing, through the combined effects of climate change, over-exploitation, pollution, and habitat loss, the next globally significant extinction event in the ocean. Last year, again, we found a Chinese drift net fleet in the Indian Ocean. Drift nets have been illegal since 1997. So we began to chase it. We chased it all the way, a whole fleet, we chased it all the way to China. And suddenly we come to the uh, the boundary on the Chinese, uh, you know, territorial limits. And suddenly there was a Chinese fleet, Navy fleet. And the, ca and the fishing boats said, help us, help us, we're being pursued by pirates. And so the captain on one of the naval vessels said, what's going on here? And we said, we caught these guys fishing illegally, using drift nets for illegal. And we sent the evidence to Beijing. And the captain said, bring them in. We brought them in, all those captains went to jail. You know, so. So the, the thing is, the laws are there. So presently, right now, we're working in partnership with the Mexican government to protect the endangered vaquita. The vaquita is the smallest dolphin, porpoise in the world. If, uh, if we weren't there, it would now be extinct. We've confiscated 450 nets from poachers over the last three years, and we're going back again in two months. 
We're in partnership with the governments of Gabon and Tanzania and Liberia and San Tome to stop the European and Asian fishing fleets which are pirating everything in their water. And by the way, the pirates of Somalia are just impoverished fishermen who were put into that position because of the real pirates, the Asian and European fishing fleets which stole everything from them and nobody really seemed to think too much about that. Uh, we're in partnership with the government of Ecuador. We're in partnership with uh, the police in Sicily to protect their marine reserves there. And we found that these are the really good partnerships because we can provide the ships, we can provide the volunteers, and they can provide the authority. And, and that helps uh, tremendously. So we work in partnership with governments inside territorial limits, outside of territorial limits. Well, that's the Wild West, so we pretty much are on our own out there. But, uh, and it, it can get dangerous. We, we liberated 800 bluefin tuna off the coast of Libya in 2011. And of course, uh, we were shot at and everything else like that, but it was nothing more exhilarating than to dive into those nets, cut them open, and we'll see 800 bluefin tuna run out like racehorses into the, into the Mediterranean. And also to expose you know, what they're doing. Uh, unfortunately, you know, governments tend to support the criminals. You know, because, well, you're going to cut off the money. 40% of all the fish that is sold anywhere in the world has been caught illegally. We've got to get to the bottom of why that is happening. You know, right now we have uh, one of our boats that's permanently, uh, well, working all summer with us uh, opposing the fish farms in British Columbia. And uh, we're working with the First Nations there. They're now occupying two of those fish farms. And we're exposing what's happening because of the domestic farming of salmon is an insidious, insidious threat to survival of life in the ocean. The spreading of parasites and viruses from farm salmon, an exotic species, to native species. And an uh, incredible source of pollution. And by the way, if you eat salmon, farm-raised salmon, which I notice is served here, uh, that color of that fish isn't exactly real. They have a dirty white flesh, so they put dye in the food pellets to get that color. And that, so we're trying to expose all of that and the fact that they're heavily overdosed with growth hormones and antibiotics and all sorts of things. It's basically poison. But the real, the real problem is that it's threatening the survival of the wild salmon populations uh, around the world. And so we go where people don't want us to go and we say things that people don't want us to say because that, in my opinion, is the business of a conservationist, to rock the boat to say things that people don't like, and to do things that people don't want to be seen done. That is our business. We're not popular, but we don't really care. We're not into the popularity contest. I refer to ourselves as the ladies of the night of the conservation movement. People agree with us, but they don't want to be seen with us in the daytime. <laughs> so, But right now, like I said, we have 12 ships out there and they're making a difference in every way. And anybody, anybody can join the crews. That's, they're all volunteer crews from right now, from 25 to 30 different nations. And uh, I think that there's nothing more satisfying to go out and actually do something and know that thousands of whales are alive because you intervened and thousands of sharks are alive because you've intervened. That really is a sense of achievement, a sense of satisfaction, which is why we get so many people wanting to join our ships and everything, so, which we're quite pleased about. Politically, uh, you know, like I said, we're not very popular and we get called names like eco-terrorists and everything. I've never worked for Monsanto, so I don't think it's a relevant thing. But, uh, <laughs> And, of course, we're called pirates. So when they started calling us pirates, I said, okay, we'll be pirates. We'll get our own pirate flag, and uh, we'll do pirate things and everything. <laughs> Kids love it and, and everything. So we got our own Jolly Roger and everything like that. And so it's been highly, highly successful in that respect. So... Um, I would encourage you to follow us on, our, on the social networks and what our ships are doing, where they are, and if anybody wants to crew or participate, just let us know and uh, we'll find a place for you on board one of the vessels. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, never been to Nantucket before. I never had any desire to come here. This is the island of monsters that sent out a fleet of murderers to take the lives of the greatest and most intelligent species on this planet. So I'm happy to say that the monsters are gone. 
But I think it's an appropriate place to uh, talk about a story that changed my life. And it goes back to 1975. I was a co-founder of Greenpeace, and we came up with this idea to protect whales. We were eating a lot of Gandhi at the time, and we thought that all we had to do was put our bodies between the harpoons and the whales, and they wouldn't kill the whales. So Robert Hunter and I, in June of 1975, we found ourselves in a small inflatable boat in the Pacific, 60 miles off of California, in the middle of the Russian whaling fleet. And uh, suddenly we found ourselves in front of a harpoon vessel that was going at full speed, and in front of us were eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time that the, uh, the harpooner got ready to fire, I would get in his way and block his harpoon. And this worked for about 25 minutes, until the captain on the whaling vessel came out and uh, screamed into the ear of the harpooner. Then he looked at us, brought his finger across his throat and smiled, and that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to be of much use that day. And suddenly the harpoon was fired in an enormous explosion. It flew over our head and hit the backside of one of the females in the pot of sperm whales. And she screamed. It was something like a, a woman screaming. It was just unnerving. And suddenly, after this fountain of blood went all over the place, suddenly the largest whale in that pod slapped the, the, the surface with his tail and disappeared. And he swam directly underneath of us and hurled himself straight towards the harpooner on that Soviet vessel. But they were ready for him with an unattached harpoon and at point blank range he pulled the trigger, struck the whale in the head and that whale screamed. There was blood everywhere. He fell back into the sea. He was he was rolling in agony on the surface. And as he did, I, I caught his eye. And what I, suddenly, he stopped, he dove. I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight towards us. And he came at us really fast and out of the water. So the next move was to fall straight on top of our little boat. And as his head rose out of the water and I looked into an eye that was right there, an eye the size of my fist, what I saw in that eye changed my life forever because I felt that the whale understood what we were trying to do. Because I could see the movement he made, the effort he made to pull himself back. And he began to slide back into the sea. I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface, and he died. Could have killed us. Chose not to do so. I'm personally indebted to that whale for the fact that I'm alive. But I saw something else in that eye, and it was pity. Not for himself, but for us, that we could do something like that. And I said to myself, why are they killing these whales? You don't eat sperm whale meat, you kill them for oil. And the Russians especially had a need for it for, because it's a highly heat resistant oil. Their need was for the construction and building of intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's one of the best oils they could use on that. And I said to myself in the middle of this Russian whaling fleet, here we are killing these incredibly magnificent, self-aware, sentient beings for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me, we're insane. We're ecologically insane. And from that moment on, I said, I'm going to do everything in my life to protect them. And uh, so I don't do this for people. I do it for them. 1986, we, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet in Reykjavik Harbor. And I had some colleagues in the environmental movement come up and said, just want to let you know that what you did there was irresponsible, criminal, reprehensible, and unforgivable. I said, so? I said, John, didn't sink those whales for you, whaling vessels for you. I didn't sink them for any human being. We sunk them for the whales. Just find me one whale anywhere on this planet who disagreed with what we did. I promise you we won't do it again. Because I left Greenpeace then, as I was a co-founder of Greenpeace, but I left in 1977 to set up Sea Shepherd because I got tired of hanging banners, I got tired of taking pictures, I got tired of witnessing death and doing nothing about it. So that's why we set up the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. We're not a protest organization. What we are is an interventionist organization and we're dedicated to stopping illegal exploitation of marine wildlife. Now everything from plankton all the way up to the great whales. And so today, we have a fleet of 12 ships. There's right now, there's 250 volunteers out on the ocean and they're intervening wherever we can make a difference. Our vessel, the Bob Barker, we named the boats after the people who sponsor the boats. Bob Barker gave us $5 million to buy his boat, 
That boat right now is off of Gabon, working with the Gabonese authorities to go after illegal fishing, fisher offer, operations, and uh, have arrested quite a few fishing vessels. Last week, working with the police in Timor, we arrested six Chinese fishing vessels, and they're now being investigated. Two months ago, we stopped a Chinese vessel in the Galapagos with 6,900 sharks on board, and the Ecuadorians took action right away. Captain got four years, the officers two years, the crew one year, $6 million fine the confiscation of their vessels. And of course, the most famous thing we've been doing is intervening against the Japanese whaling fleet in the Southern Ocean, and we've done that since 2005. The Japanese are international criminals when it comes to whaling. That is the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. You don't kill whales in a sanctuary. They're in violation of the International Whaling Commission. They've been condemned by the International Court of Justice. They've been condemned by the Australian Federal Court. They were fined a million dollars. They refused to pay it. These people are criminals. But it's Japan. They have money. They get to do whatever they want to do. And in fact, two months ago, they passed new laws, new anti-terrorism laws. It's now an act of terrorism if you take a picture of a dolphin being killed in Taiji, Japan. It's now an act of terrorism if you approach a whaling vessel. And they invest $50 million to subsidize this whaling fleet. And they're provided with military technology in order to find the whaling vessels. So it's a very difficult thing to keep up with. But I'm proud to say that since 2005, we saved 6,500 whales. We've lowered their quotas. And, but, and of course, the perception, the perception is, is that we are the bad guys. We are the pirates. So we get called pirates. I don't really, it doesn't really bother me, um, you know, because some, it, one thing about pirates is they get things done. They're not encumbered. <laughs> they're not encumbered by red tape and everything. But we also operate within very strict guidelines. And that 40 years of operations, we've never caused a single injury to a single person. We've never been convicted of a felony crime. And, uh, but I am on the Interpol red list. Now, the Interpol red list is for drug traffickers, serial killers, and, and uh, war criminals. And I'm the only person in history to be on that list for the crime of conspiracy to board a whaling ship. So that also indicates the power of the Japanese government. But there is a, a European parliamentary committee that's working into the abuse of Interpol, and mine's one of the cases that they're, they're cited on doing that. So the Japanese thought that by stopping me, which I'm not allowed to travel now, they thought that by stopping me, they could uh, stop Sea Shepherd. But then they discovered something. Sea Shepherd's not me. Sea Shepherd's a movement. We're not even an organization. So right now, Sea Shepherd is in 45 different countries. They're all separate entities. They all contribute to the operation of those 12 vessels. Uh, a year and a half ago, we went after the ice fish poaching fleets off of the coast of Antarctica. Uh, ice fish is actually sold as Chilean sea bass. Not, not sustainable in any way at all. And most of it's caught illegally. So what we did was we located the fleet, we got the most notorious poacher of all, a vessel called the Thunder. And we began a chase. We chased that vessel for 110 days. It was the longest pursuit of a poacher in history from the coast of Antarctica all the way up to uh, Santomi off the west coast of Africa. We chased them until they almost ran out of fuel and they couldn't go any further. So what the captain of that vessel did was he sunk his ship in front of us in order to destroy the evidence that was on board. But as it was sinking, we boarded the ship, we got the evidence, the captain's now in prison, the officers are in prison, and the company was fined 17 million euros. So, <laughs> now one of the criticisms is that we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be taking the law into our own hands. And that's the right. We shouldn't be. And we wouldn't have to do it if the governments of the world would simply do their job, which is hold up the responsibility and their obligation to the international treaties that they sign, but there's a lack of economic and political incentive on their part to do anything about it. Whaling could stop tomorrow if the United States simply applied the U.S. Department of Commerce regulations for any country in violation of the IWC. They never do. Every year they send a strongly worded letter of condemnation to the Japan or Norway and Iceland, and every year they just drop it in the garbage and ignore it, and everything goes on, because trade deals, trade agreements govern, govern all these, their activity. Well, we can't upset the Japanese, we can't upset the Norwegians, you know, but basically what they're doing is enabling criminal operations. 
We have one motto in, in Sea Shepherd, and that is, if the ocean dies, we die. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. It is the single most important issue on the planet, the survival of life in our ocean, the diversity in the ocean. Consider the Earth as a spaceship. That's what it is. We're a spaceship. We're traveling around this incredible galaxy. It takes 250 million years just to make one orbit of it. In fact, the planet's only done it 20 times. The last time we were at this place where we are now was 250 million years ago in the Permian extinction when we lost 97% of everything. Now we're in the sixth major extinction, the Anthropocene, and who knows where that's going to go, but it's certainly having an impact. But every spaceship has a life support system. It provides the food, it provides the air we breathe, it regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is run by a crew, not humans. We're passengers. We're having a great time entertaining ourselves. The crew that run the ship, while well, we're killing them. And there's only so many crew members you can kill before the whole machinery begins to fall apart. I was asked a few years ago, the Fox Network was giving me a hard time. They said, you actually said that trees and worms and bees are more important than people. I said, yes, I said that. I said, how can you justify that? I said, quite easily. They don't need us. We need them. If we lose worms and bees and trees, we don't survive. We lose phyto phytoplankton, we don't survive. But we need them. So that's the first thing you have to understand is to keep these creatures alive so that we can continue to live. Phytoplankton populations have been diminished in the world's ocean by 40% since 1950. Why? Because we killed off so many marine mammals, especially whales. One blue whale every day defecates three tons into the ocean heavily rich with nitrogen and iron, and that are the primary nutrients for the phytoplankton. So you diminish whales, you diminish phytoplankton, you diminish phytoplankton, you diminish zooplankton, you diminish fish, you create all sorts of problems. We simply are not intelligent enough to understand those relationships between all of those species. And that's going to be our undoing. You know, people say to me, how can you ask young people to risk their life to protect a whale? This is unacceptable. And that's a really strange question to me because we ask young people to risk their lives all the time. We ask young people to die for religion and for oil companies and for real estate. I think it's a far more noble pursuit to risk your life to protect a species from extinction or to save a habitat and all this for future gener generations. The reason for this is that we are anthropocentrically oriented. All we really care about is us. And that's not a recipe for survival. Every single religion on the planet puts human beings as a center. That's anthropocentrism. We have to look at it from a biocentric point of view, living in harmony with all other species. And if we can't do that, we're simply not going to survive. There are three basic laws of ecology. The law of diversity. Strength must be found in diversity. And the law of interdependence. All species are interdependent. And the law of finite resources. That there's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity. And if we don't live by those rules, we will go extinct. And again, this is like the most important thing we can develop. But because of our anthropocentric mindset, we don't even think about that. You know, nobody really thinks about the fact that if phytoplankton disappears, we all die. You know, that's the last thing on everybody's agenda. So our fight, we go into, we go into battle armed with cameras. But we also intervene directly. If they don't stop, we stop them. And uh, so we sunk quite a few ships. And like I said, we've done that without injuring anybody. And <laughs> last year, again, we found a Chinese driftlet net fleet in the Indian Ocean. Everything's going to be okay for the planet eventually. Will it be okay for humanity? Well, that's up to us. You know, whether collectively we're going to make those uh, significant changes. But before we can do that, we have to uh, cure ourselves of this collective insanity that. Uh, is infecting us, and that's, you can see that insanity in many ways. Uh, what we're doing to the planet, the wars that we have amongst ourselves, the abuses of animals, the abuses of other people. Uh, this to me is, is, a, is psychopathic. It's something that affects us all. We're all involved in it. So uh, can, we, can we cure ourselves of that? I don't know. I can only hope that we can. Oceans, our Earth, and we ourselves are facing a massive extinction. 
We have already gone beyond the point of being able to reverse the damage. As Dr. Openlander states, it has been 300 million years since the last time our oceans have been this warm and acidic, and at that time, it took over 30 million years to recover. It's a cycle that's worked perfectly for millions of years, and we have destroyed that cycle. Um, you know, 300 years ago, there was no shortage of fish in the, in the oceans. When uh, Jacques Cartier set out from France to, to Canada in 1534, there were some 45 million seals in the North Atlantic, including uh, species that are now extinct. Uh, there were animals like the sea mink, the, the Atlantic gray whale and uh, the giant auk, and once there were even walrus in the North Atlantic, all gone. We used to have beluga whales in Long Island Sound off of New York, all gone. The tragedy is, is that not only have we destroyed them, we've actually forgotten that they've ever existed, and that uh, diminishment has been ongoing. I was raised in a fishing village in eastern Canada. I've seen that diminishment in the seas. If we can replenish our ocean, and that means a total ban, on industrialized fishing operations, long lines, trawlers, saners. We have to get rid of them. We have to stop fishing. And we have to call for the organizations charged with the duty of protecting our oceans to actually protect them, not have an active hand in their destruction by peddling a myth of sustainability. So what can you do to help? Stop eating seafood and educate others Send them this video and or the blog post with all of the scientific backing via careful citations. Dig into those resources if you doubt these claims. But make a change. If the oceans die, we all die.